probably look like to you? Caused by? It's probably bacterial because you've got the enlarged lymph nodes, you've got the fever. Remember the things that we spoke about. So if it was just red and swollen and there was no temperature but she still have a sore throat and there's no lymph nodes, do you think an antibiotic is going to be indicated? No. Not yet. Okay. So there are ways that we can um, motivate why we thought that an antibiotic was indicated. And these are the types of things that we need to look at. So when we are rationalizing that an antibiotic was indicated, we can say, yes, she had fever, yes, lymph nodes, okay? There was some pus stuff in her, um, on her tonsils. It's not just a normal swollen tonsils that could have been due to a post-nasal drip, maybe. Okay. Um, so now, I would like to encourage you maybe to have a look at some notes. What um, antibiotic would you give this girl? So we didn't do a, a culture. We are going to check what is probably the most common bacteria that we could have caused this. Yeah, so usually with throat infections, streptococcus is probably our first one, okay? The other ones that lives up here is probably also a gram positive bacteria. So possibly streptococcus and other gram positives because that's usually what lives in the organs. Up. Okay. So, in that case, if you have to think about antibiotics that cover gram positive, what could be possible antibiotics that we might want to use? Amoxicillin. Amoxicillin, yes. Okay. So, amoxicillin is mainly gram positive, it covers some gram negatives. Okay. Anything else you would like to suggest? <coughs> yes, amoxicillin is penicillin. Right. So when you are suggesting an antibiotic, you can't just tell me penicillin because penicillin is a class of antibiotics. So the class of antibiotics that we are going to use are going to be penicillin, but when you're recommending one, be specific, amoxicillin, good one, okay? She can drink it at home. Good absorption. What are other antibiotics that also cover gram positive? Yes, so that might also be a rational first or second generation cephalosporin. <coughs> what else? If she's allergic to penicillins? Mm -hmm. A macrolide, for example. Which one would you choose? Azithromycin is usually the most common one. It's the most available one. I don't think any others are really available. Yes, yeah, so azithromycin does cover the same spectrum as penicillin. Who wants to prescribe colomoxicare? Or augmentin. Calamoxiclab is augmentin. Who would want to prescribe augmentin instead of just normal amoxicillin? So in that case, augmentin is a little bit of an overkill, wouldn't it? Because now you're prescribing even a broader spectrum where amoxicillin probably covers your most 
most common ones anyway. So how would you now tell the patient? So we're dispensing five days of amoxicillin, okay? 500 milligrams TDS. And now we need to tell the patient, okay, you know it, the medicine should start working. When, are, when is the patient going to start to feel better now? Yes, usually about 48 hours. So if the patient doesn't it start at least to feel better in 48 hours, what could be the reason for that? It might be a resistant bacteria. Yes, what else? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if it's resistant to amoxicillin, you're going to um, prescribe something more broader spectrum. What could be another reason? It's not bacterial. It's not bacterial, yes. Probably. Okay. Any, any side effects that patients on amoxicillin must watch out for? Hey? <coughs> What's the most common side effect associated with penicillins? Hypersensitivity reaction. So how is she going to know she's got a hypersensitivity reaction? It's usually skin rash. Yes. Okay. So what, if we don't treat this infection well, what is possible complications of sore throat? <coughs> Have you seen it in the hospital? <coughs> a complication of a sore throat. <coughs> a serious one. No, that is not, that is not um, localized to the throat area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She said it's closer to the airway. Yeah, but not, not related to the airway. Mm -hmm. Yes? Not really. Okay, so rheumatic fever. Have you heard about rheumatic fever? Can be a side effect if we don't treat a strip throat very well and then we're starting to look at infective endocarditis on the side. Have you seen the infective endocarditis in the hospital? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, <coughs> it usually or it could follow a strip throat that was not treated or that could be a complication. So let's look at the next scenario. So she's pregnant. Mild case of penicillin allergy. Diagnosed with primary syphilis. What is the treatment of choice in primary syphilis? If you have your guidelines or the EML app. Okay. So syphilis is an interesting one. You haven't done STIs yet. Okay. When are you doing that? Do you know? <coughs> Have you ever treated a sexually transmitted infection in our school? No. 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 If you open your, your EML, 
Um, in South Africa, we use a syndromic approach to STI treatment. So we treat for a bunch of conditions based on the symptoms. So either there can be an ulcer or there can be discharge. Okay. And primary syphilis is usually under the ulcer, the ulcer <coughs> symptoms. Okay. Syphilis specifically, the other common ulcer in South Africa is herpes. Okay. So syphilis and herpes falls under the ulcer symptoms. If you can know that it is syphilis, syphilis, usually you want to prefer benzalpenicillin injection. Okay. So now if people are pregnant and they <coughs> have a minor thing or minor allergy to uh, penicillin like a, a rash, you know, it's not that bad. So what they do, and maybe some of you have seen it, they come into hospital for penicillin desensitization treatment. So they give low doses of penicillin to desensitize the patient to the rash or to the, the um, hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, because especially with pregnant women with STI, what can happen if you don't treat it? They can give it to their babies. So you want to treat uh, is the eye, um, and benzoyl penicillin is the best to treat the plus um, effective. Yes, so that is an interesting scenario. So you might see penicillin desensitization happening in the hospital. Has anybody seen this before? Not really. Okay. active protein in their blood. Okay.
So, if you are on the EML app, can you quickly read to us what they say about an acute exacerbation? Hmm? Of so this is one of the only instances or very few instances <coughs> where you can prescribe a prophylactic antibiotic in an acute exacerbation. Okay, because these patients are very high risk to get a secondary um, bacterial infection because of all the phlegm in their in their um, lungs. Okay. <coughs> so you can go through your EML and see what you need. Okay, so let's remind ourselves about vancomycin. So let's look at 58-year-old male patient, diagnosed with floxacillin resistance, staphylococcus, sepsis. <coughs> sepsis meaning what is infected? The blood, yes. Okay. Serum creatinine level of 100, micromol per liter. What does serum creatinine tell us? Hmm? What function? The, yes, the kidneys. So if your serum creatinine is increased, okay, it means your kidneys are not working properly because the kidneys must excrete your creatinine. So if it's not excreting it properly, then the levels increase. Okay. The doctor prescribes vancomycin IV every 12 hours. So why do you think this case talks about creatinine levels? When we're talking about vancomycin. What is the major toxicity of vancomycin? No. Auto and nephrotoxicity, yes. So when we are administering vancomycin, we need to make sure that the kidneys are okay and they can handle it. the vancomycin is working in this patient? Hmm? Okay, so there's safety monitoring and efficacy monitoring. So the creatinine will have to do with the safety monitoring of the drug Efficacy monitoring will do will have to do with is the medicine working? So when you have a sepsis, what is some of the signs and symptoms that people have when they have sepsis? Fever. <coughs> what does the vitals look like in a person with sepsis? So there's fever, the blood pressure is low, heart rate is high, respiratory rate is high, yes. So you can look at the vitals, you take the vitals every day and if it's starting to stabilize, then you know we're getting somewhere. So you can look at the vitals. What else can we have a look at? To see if the medicine is working. <coughs> what do you think? <coughs> what?
What do we already have? That we can repeat. We've got the culture, okay, so we might want to repeat the culture once we think the patient is healed. And then there shouldn't be bacteria anymore. We can look at um, systemic um, inflammatory indicators like the CRP. So if the CRP, the CRP in the sepsis will be very high. So if it's coming down, with the vancomycin administration, we know that there's less systemic inflammation, so it means that the medication is working. Okay. So a nice one, Mrs. C has been hospitalized for dehydration, secondary to chronic diarrhea. On day three of her hospital stay, the site of her arm where a drip has been <coughs> set up presented with a large area of erythema. Otherwise, Mrs. C is systemically well and her diarrhea is better. She is diagnosed with peripheral line sepsis. So, can you remember, what is the source of infection here? It is a hospital-acquired infection. Yes. Because she got the infection three days after. So, you have to be in hospital for more than 48 hours to have a hospital-acquired infection. And you have to be, didn't have that before you can eat. So it's a hospital acquired infection. So why is it important to, to know that? <coughs> yes, so that we know what types of antibiotics to give and in general what types of antibiotics are we going to give now to this patient? <coughs> hmm? Yes, so we're going to give a second line antibiotic. We're not going to give amoxicillin or something like that because it's a more, we're expecting higher levels of resistance in bacteria that lives in the hospital. Okay. So what organism... So most yours, so your staphylococcus, okay, so it's gram, you, okay, good, so with skin infections we generally can cover for gram positive, so now what treatment are we going to give her? The syphilis foreign, what generation? First generation. Second generation. Any thirds? <laughs> what does the EML say? Male patient, 
diagnosed with C. difficile diarrhea five days ago. He's on day five of metronidazole treatment and has shown no signs of any clinical improvement. So usually when C. difficile infection, first line treatment for it is metronidazole. What do you know about metronidazole? What can you remember about metronidazole that we talked about? Anything. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's got a good oral absorption profile. What else? Yes, it targets anaerobic bacteria. So see, the is the anaerobic. Okay. And metronidazole isn't a really um, a antibiotic. It's an antiparasitic agent, but it does work very well for anaerobes. Okay, anaerobic bacteria. So now metronidazole is not working. Usually our second treat line treatment for C. diff <coughs> is vancomycin, but it's a special type of vancomycin because now how are we administering the vancomycin? Orally, yes. So does vancomycin get, get absorbed orally? No. But it's good because where do we want the vancomycin to work in the body? In the intestine, because the C. diff is sitting inside the intestine. Okay, so it's the only time when we give vancomycin orally. Otherwise, we will always give vancomycin IV. Yes. Okay, so if we're giving it orally, are we concerned about toxicity? No. Maybe local toxicity, but it's not in the blood where it can cause renal impairment or autotoxicity. Okay. For our general toxicity that we're worried about for vancomycin, it's usually with IV administration when it is in the blood. Okay. Okay, we are going to look at this one and then we are going to be finished. I'm going to go on to the to the next one. So this is another case study. An ill-looking young female patient comes into the pharmacy complaining of a headache, nausea, fever and muscle and joint pains. She just came back from a long weekend hiking in the Kruger. The doctor has just confirmed the diagnosis of tick bite fever or rickettsial disease. Can you remember what is the antibiotic of choice for tick bite fever? It is? It is tetracyclines. Yes. So, doxycycline is usually given first line. What other antibiotic? also cover a kid cell disease that's not necessarily first line. Can you remember the other one that we spoke about? <coughs> it is? <laughs> yes, so macrolides also cover for atypical organisms, okay, not as well as doxycycline. What, what is the other one? Other other one is chlorophenicol. But we won't give chlorophenicol, you know, much because it's very toxic. So what is the mechanism of action of tetracyclines again? It 
belongs to the big class of is it a cell wall synthesis inhibitor? No. no. It is a protein synthesis inhibitor. Yes. Okay. So how would you counsel a patient if you're giving a doxycycline? What can you remember about contraindications and side effects and what to do when you drink it? Yes? Don't drink it with calcium supplements. What else? Must you not drink it with? And acids. Yes? Anything else? Hmm? After a meal, yes, you must take it after a meal because otherwise it's going to make you nauseous. Yeah, so your meal mustn't include milk or iron tablets, okay? Because tetracyclines chelates with your um, <coughs> anions or no cations in the stomach and then it doesn't get absorbed. Okay, what else must she do? So she must eat and when she drink the tablet? She must drink lots of water, yes, why? Because of the esophageal irritation. What must she also not do after she drinks the tablet? She must stand up, she must not lie down, yes. Okay, good, do you remember well? Because of the esophageal irritation. Because otherwise it can go back into your esophagus. Okay. What else? <coughs> She's young. So, so it's just a feeling. Um, it's going to reduce the efficacy of oral contraceptives. Um, okay, so it might. Remember in the World Health Organization said that it's okay, it won't reduce the efficacy of oral contraceptives, but why is that type of thing important? When is tetracyclines contraindicated? In? Pregnancy. And young females can be pregnant. It is possible. Okay, so you have to rule out pregnancy. Okay, so it did have something to do with family planning, but not exactly that. Okay. Are you happy we counseled her properly? Yeah. Okay. Can we start again? The next section that we're going to look at today is um, antifungals. Okay, so in your textbook, antifungals is from page 193 to 196. If you want to follow there. There are two main broad types of fungal infections that we get. The one is our skin infections or um, that affects mucous membranes and the other ones are systemic fungal infections. Okay, skin infections are quite common and we can either treat it topically or orally. Um, systemic fungal infections is usually not very common and we mostly find that it um, occurs in immunocompromised patients. Okay, so there, there are a type of risk. So fungal infections has become more common lately. Okay, and 
it is probably due to the widespread use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, why would a broad spectrum antibiotic increase the prevalence of fungal infections, do you think? Yes. So, a broad spectrum antibiotic will kill most of your normal flora, okay? And then the normal fungi flora that is in your body can now grow without any competition because nothing is eating their food, nothing is pushing them to the side, they can just grow. So in that way you get a super infection, okay, that could be fungal, okay. In South Africa we've got a lot of HIV, HIV tends to suppress people's immune system and it makes them more at risk to develop opportunistic infection. So opportunistic infection is an infection that you, that you don't normally get. Okay. So if you've got a normal immune system, those type of pathogens will not make you sick. Um, then also, uh, people are getting organ transplants, more and more people are getting organ transplants. Um, they have to then be on what kinds of drugs? Usually when you get an organ transplant, they have to give you... Hmm? Immunosuppressants or corticosteroids. Okay, to keep your immune system from rejecting the organ. Okay. Um, and cancer chemotherapy. So cancer chemotherapy basically kills a lot of your white blood cells. And if your white blood cells are low, you don't have an immune system. Okay. Then also elderly people, people with diabetes, pregnant women and burn victims are more <coughs> prone to developing candidiasis. So let's look at our superficial fungal infections that is very common. So the two main classes is your candida, which is more your thrush type of um, infections and then your dermatophytes. So your dermatophytes is mainly tinea, okay, it's commonly called ringworm and usually the type of ringworm is classified as going to wear in the body occurs, okay. So this dermatophytes, it's Direct contact, so if you have a ringworm and I touch your ringworm, then I can get the ringworm. Usually children scratch the ringworms and then they scratch in another place and it is contagious everywhere. Okay, so it's transmitted via direct contact. Usually the tinea will invade the stratum corneum but not the living tissue. So it, in general, uh, invades the outer layer of the skin. It doesn't go <coughs> very deep, okay? And it grows and proliferates in this non cornified layer of keratinized tissue. Okay, so it generally is in the non-living part of the skin, um, living on the corn, Keratinized tissue. So it lives on keratin. Okay. And you will find that drugs that kills the keratin or that um, degrades keratin it can sometimes be used for tinea infections. It's not very um, potent, but it can be used. So here is the different places that it can be. Tinea capitis is usually on this scalp or the head. Tinea cruris is in the groin area. Tinea pedis is on the feet. 
okay, like athlete's foot. Mm -hmm. And tinea corporis is on the body. Okay. Usually it's itchy. <coughs> it's like a ring. You can see there's a ring like patch here. That's probably a patch. They scratch there and then they scratch here. So it's um, contagious. It usually has raised borders and it grows outwards. Okay. And as the patch grows outward, the center might become hyperpigmented, so it might become longer. For tinea capitis, there's usually round or bold patches of scales with stumps of broken off hair. Do not shave the head. You're going to infect the whole head. Okay? Do not share combs and airbrushes. trimazole cream that you can apply three times a day. Continue for two weeks after the lesions have cleared. So this is the not so nice part about treating a fungal infection is you usually have to continue for quite a while after there's nothing there anymore. Okay? It's, it's because the fungus can live there for a while without you seeing it. Then tinea capitis, which is the scalp, because we cannot put the cream nicely in the air. We want to treat it systemically. Okay, so we will use fluconazole um, for 28 days. So that's quite long. You will find treating fungal infections generally takes longer than bacterial infections. are more prevalent in adolescents and young adults and men. Um, the nail involvement is usually in elderly people. It's usually itchy. Okay. Um, itchy, irritation, burning sensations. Um, it usually tends to be dry. Dry, scaly type. Um, and there's usually an acute onset with no previous symptoms. And there could be atypical lesions, which means it can only be on the one side. Usually your eczema is, will be on both sides. Where with tinea, it will, you know, it won't affect both sides usually, unless you have scratched. Okay. So for athletes food, Usually communal changing rooms or showers. Um, it is usually between the small toe, that's where it starts. And you can see pictures of what it looks like. It can be dry or soggy. You can look at the... The, <laughs> the interior corporis is on the body. It's not the face, hands, feet, groin or skull. Okay. The near pleuris is in the groin region. So the benefine is usually the one. So the benefine isn't available in the government. Okay. So in the government you will get a clotrimazole treatment for your athlete's foot. When you go to the pharmacy you can buy a more expensive cream. Um, that has the benefine in. Uh, it works faster than clotrimazole, um, but it is also more expensive. Okay. And you only have to apply it for one week. The other one you apply for two weeks after it has healed. Okay. So there are pros and cons to different treatments. Then the very cheap one is your benzoic acid and salicylic acid. It's a keratolytic agent, so it means it's not antifungal, it rather 
works on the food that the fungus is eating. Okay. So it removes the keratin layer and the fungus lives in the keratin layer. So um, it has got lower cure rates and it is slower, the symptoms is much slower <coughs> to resolve because it doesn't have direct antifungal um, effects. Your topical imidazoles, for example, your clotrimazole treatment, which you will probably find in the government and then the other types is ketoconazole and myconazole um, they are all used and then you also get one called tolmaftate or tinadim um, doesn't work it's not as effective as the benefit um, then for general treatment, we also get uh, your undecanoates like mycota, okay? You can get a powder that you put in your shoes if you have athlete's foot. Um, you can also apply that in uh, until seven days after the infection has cleared. When are fungal nail infections? So usually with a nail, in, a skin infection is easy. A nail infection is more difficult to treat because nails grow very <coughs> slowly. Okay, and you basically have to treat until the nail has totally grown out. So nail infections usually are um, affect older people. Okay. It's called oncomycosis. It's the big word for it. And usually there was an initial skin infection. The people are immunocompromised. Or there's poor peripheral circulation. Which <coughs> happens in what type of patients? Poor peripheral circulation. <coughs> Diabetics, yes. So they are more prone to getting it. Especially nail infections in their toes, in their toenails. So treatment considerations, some cases you want to, to completely remove the nail. And usually if you want to treat it, there's a systemic therapy that you have to take and it's for a few months that you have to take it. There are nail paint for limited infections, so if you have maybe just two nails affected that is very, you know, it's a small piece of infection, so you can use the nail paint, um, otherwise you take your systemic treatment. So in terms of nail paint, there is amyrolfine. Um, so It is only if, if two nails are affected. Affected. So if more than two nails are affected, you have to take systemic treatment anyway. Um, so usually you will file away as much as the nail of the nail that you can. Don't let other people use the nail file, please. Okay, because it can be contagious. Okay. And then you apply weekly until the nail has regrown. So this takes about 9 to 12 months. So for nail infections, is a, is a difficult one to treat. The most common antifungal that we use for nail infections is called griseofulvin. Okay, It concentrates in the keratin. Okay, So it is there. It kills the fungus while it is there in the keratin. Um, usually the absorption of griseofulvin is increased if you take it with a fatty meal um, and you take it daily for extended periods of time. So these, these will be repeat prescriptions that you get for griseofulvin. Then a, Interesting kind of fungal infection is 
tinea versicolor. You can't see it. It's like white, little white round patches. It's usually on the on the back. Okay, this one is not contagious. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay, and then we usually use selenium sulfide shampoo or sun cell sun. Apply for three days, leave on for half an hour, then wash off. So repeat for three days. That will usually cure that infection. Yes. They usually say if you wear something that the person has worn, you get the fun infection. Not this time. Maybe the tinea, the other tinea infections. Okay, the tinea porous. Yes, that is contagious. Not this specific one. Then, so we've spoken about tinea. Now we go on to candida. Um, that can also cause superficial infections of the mucous membranes, usually of the vagina or the mouth or any type of skin. Okay, so it's usually painful creamy white patches that you can scrape off the tongue and buckle mucosa. And it's common in small babies. Thrush. Risk factors can be poor oral hygiene, immunosuppression, prolonged use of broad spectrum antibiotics or corticosteroids, certain chronic diseases, and trauma in the mouth. General measures. So Look at the risk factors and try to treat the risk factors, improve our hygiene, feed infants with a cup instead of a bottle and ensure proper fitting dentures. If you have false teeth, they must fit properly. The treatment that you will probably get at the clinic will be nice statin suspension, one mil six hourly after meals for seven days. Okay, you want to swirl it around in the mouth because as soon as you swallow it, it's gone. Okay, so you want to keep it in contact with the, um, with the uh, lesions as long as possible. Okay, so infants, the mother will apply it to the front of the mouth and spread it over the lesions. You need to continue treatment for 48 hours after it has been cured. So with nystatin, there is no GI absorption. It's a lot like vancomycin. The vancomycin, not absorbed if you take it orally. Nystatin, also not absorbed. Um, so it will mostly just go right through to the other end. It is safe in pregnancy. And it is the little cousin of amphotericin B that we'll talk about just now. Okay, so antifungals mechanism of action. You've, you've noticed that I spoke about a lot of different types of antifungals, but I haven't spoken about the mechanism of action. So let's look at the mechanism of action. I'm going to show you a video. Is that okay? Yes, <coughs> I've also put these videos on Ikamba so you can go and download them and look at them. So first, we want to know what does the fungus look like? So we're going to look at the overview. Let's see if this thing works now.
sterol in the fungal cell membrane. The fungal cell wall is made up of 80 to 90 percent polysaccharides. In yeast, the cell wall contains several different polysaccharides, including glucans, polymers of glucose, mannan, polymer of mannanos, and chitin, a polymer of N-acetyl glucosamine. Glucan is a major component of the fungal cell wall. was basically showing you that ergosterol in the fungal cell membrane keeps it stable and flexible. What am I? No. <coughs> so um, there's also, I, I want to then just show you amphotericin. But quickly, if we can have a look at the picture. No, where is the picture? Okay. So if we look at the picture that I have here, you will see there is this is the process of ergosterol synthesis. You see it. So ergosterol is synthesized and it is put into the cell membrane. Okay, to keep the, the organism stable and flexible. So the cell membrane has to be intact. Okay? And the other thing that they spoke about was the cell wall and the, the beta-1,3 glucan that the cell wall was made up of. Okay, so you will see the amorolfin, which is the nail polish that we get for the fungal infections, and the tibinafine that we spoke about, that's a good for the, for the tinea pedis, interferes in this step of algosterol synthesis. Okay? Then your azoles, which is your trimazole and fluconazole, they interfere here when the nosterol is converted to algosterol. Ergosterol. Okay. So these <coughs> both interfere with cell membrane synthesis. Okay. Then the echinocandins. Um, prevent that beta-1,3 glucan <coughs> from making, so it interferes with your cell wall synthesis. Yes. And then amphotericin um, binds to your ergosterol in your cell membrane, and it makes pores. Let me quickly show you how amphotericin works. Because that's quite interesting. The role of amphotericin. Oh,
Gosterol in the cell membrane and it then aggregates and it make a little pore in there. Okay, so it's quite a cool mechanism, I think. Okay. So the echinocandins that you probably won't see very soon in government hospital um, basically then prevents that um, heta 13 glucan synthesis in the cell wall. Okay. Um, Griseofulvin that we spoke about, so we treat the nail infections with a Griseofulvin. It interferes with mitosis, so the division of the, the fungal cell by binding to this microtubule system. So if you're interfering with the microtubule system, the cell cannot divide in two. Okay. So it inhibits replication and then phlecytosine inhibits DNA synthesis. Okay. So it's like our antibacterials that inhibits DNA synthesis. What was examples of our DNA synthesis inhibitors for our antibacterials again? It was the... What's examples of our DNA synthesis inhibitors for antibacterials? Yes, like the Brixantacin and Moxiflocin. Okay? Good. So you can see that the antifungals, the mechanisms of action, is a little bit the same as antibacterials. Because some inhibits the cell wall, some inhibits the cell membrane, some inhibits DNA synthesis. Okay? So there's some overlap between what they are doing, but they are working very specifically on, on specific stuff. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Start again. So this slide basically shows you a summary of the different types of antifungal agents that is in existence, I think. So the first class is your polyene antibiotics, which is um, amphotericin B and Istatin. Um, then we have Griseofulvin, which is on its own. We've got, this is probably one of the newer ones, the echinocandins. Okay, they are second line <coughs> agents. So we also have our first line and second line antifungals. Okay, your echinocandins are usually second line for severe um, can candida infections. Then we've got the biggest class is the azoles. Okay, and you've probably seen many of them. You've probably seen fluconazole before and clotrimazole cream. Okay, so all the ones that ends with an azole is, belong to the azole group. Then we've got some other ones, so you'll see the benefin is under other, um, and also flucytosine. So flucytosine, very expensive, 
But um, according to the new cryptococcal meningitis treatment guidelines, fluconazole is one of the three drugs that, uh, yeah, flucytosine is one of the three drugs to treat cryptococcal meningitis. Have you seen cryptococcal meningitis in the hospitals? Some of you have, yeah. <coughs> Usually affecting HIV positive patients with very low CD4 counts. Okay. And then we usually treat with a combination of amphotericin B and fluconazole. And now the newest kid on the block is flucytosine. So you can go and have a look at those videos again if you just want to um, hear better maybe at home. So now we've dealt with our common skin infections. Now we are going over to our serious systemic fungal infections. Okay. Now candidiasis. You can get a normal oral or vaginal candidiasis or you can get the oropharyngeal candidiasis, which goes further into your esophagus. So you cannot treat it topically with nystatin. You have to take um, systemic drugs to treat that. Um, a common one that we see is cryptococcal meningitis. And the other uh, one is pulmonary aspergillosis. That is usually in elderly patients. Okay. Um, with bone marrow suppression, neutropenia, and cystic fibrosis. Okay, so candida os osophagitis or esophageal candidiasis, um, mostly HIV patients, and the way that you can distinguish just the normal oral thrush from a esophagitis is they will have difficulty swallowing. So if the patient has difficulty swallowing, then a nystatin suspension isn't going to work. You have to give systemic fluconazole. Okay. The other drug that you would, I don't know, well, it's used fairly often because it's used for um, cryptococcal meningitis. Usually amphotericin B is the drug of choice for systemic mycosis. Um, it is administered IV and it is also one of those drugs that is extremely nephrotoxic. Okay, so let's make a gang. So let's say the nephrotoxic gang of anti- Microbials will include amphotericin, which other antimicrobial is also severely nephrotoxic, as you can remember. Yes, vancomycin. And the other lot, severely nephrotoxic, is your... Hmm? Is the... Aminoglycosides. Okay. So amphotericin B, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, all of them are bad boys. <coughs> Antimicrobials. Okay. Um, there's a high probability of adverse effects with amphotericin um, relating to drug toxicity and administration. So as the same as with vancomycin, where you want to have a very slow infusion, okay, you want to have a slow infusion of amphotericin B, because it can also, um, if, if you infuse it too fast, it can have that bad effects on the patient, that acute effects. Also, you have to do your toxicity monitoring. Which is very important. Fluconazole, usually used in the treatment of candidiasis and as an adjunct therapy 
for cryptococcal meningitis. Okay, so you'll usually use a combination of amphotericin B and fluconazole. And now with the new guidelines, flucytosine as well. Um, it is widely distributed, also in the CSF, which makes it good for meningitis because it has to be there. Excretion is in the urine mainly. The thing about azoles is all of them have a differing propensity to inhibit cytochrome P450. Okay. And if we're inhibiting cytochrome P450, what is the potential always? For drug interactions. Remember cytochrome is one of hepatic of the hepatic enzymes that um, metabolizes drugs. So if you are slowing down cytochrome P450, the other drugs are going to be metabolized slower, which means they will have increased levels in the blood. Okay. And then you get your normal thyroid, normal <coughs> mounting diarrhea, dyspepsia, abdominal pain, related skin rash. Okay, so that is our fungal infections. The last part of the chapter speaks about infestations. Okay, so infection is usually due to a bacteria, a virus, or a fungus. An infestation is usually due to a protozoa, a helminth, which is a worm, or an ectoparasite, like scabies or lice. Okay. Have you heard about scabies? Yes. Do you know how to treat it? Yes. Okay. So, when we look at our protozoal diseases, the biggest one is malaria. Luckily, we don't have malaria in the Western Cape, but if you go to the northern parts of South Africa and Mozambique and Swaziland, they've got malaria there. Um, Amoebiasis, trichomoniasis, giardiasis, and bilharzia, all of them of protozoal diseases. The last four can be treated with metronidazole. Okay. So, if we look at malaria, so it's only those northeastern, no? Yes, northeastern parts of South Africa that um, is affected by malaria and big parts of Africa too. Okay, so with malaria, we get prophylaxis and treatment. Prophylaxis meaning we are preventing it. So we give prophylaxis to people who don't have malaria. <coughs> we give treatment to people who have contracted malaria. Okay. So for prophylaxis, there are pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods. And then your chemoprophylaxis is then the medicine that you are drinking to prevent your malaria. So it's the highest mortality disease of all parasitic diseases spread by the Anopheles mosquito. And the type of protozoa in malaria is plasmodium species. Falciparum is the most prevalent and dangerous one in Africa and the other ones are not as prevalent and not so dangerous. Okay, so the ABC of malaria is first of all to be aware of it. Okay, where is the malaria areas? Okay, so this is just a, a map of the world. 
and the red parts is where you have malaria transmission all the time. There malaria is in some parts and malaria transmission does not occur. So you can see in South Africa, it's not really something. Little bit here, lots there. Okay. It also depends on the time of the year. So uh, malaria is more prevalent in the rainy season. So if you go in the dry season, the chances are less of getting it. If you are high on the mountain tops, mosquitoes don't fly that high. Okay. Um, and then obviously the number of times they bite you. Okay. So the second one is bite prevention. We've all seen mosquito nets very effective, um, <coughs> wearing long sleeves, not going out, you know, after the sun has set, because that's when the mosquitoes go out, all of those things. High-risk individuals should preferably avoid malaria areas. Who are they? They are pregnant women. Infants and children under five, older people, and immunocompromised people. So that is high risk people. We don't want them to get malaria because it just becomes complicated. Okay. Unfortunately, people who live in countries where they eat malaria don't have a choice. This is more people who want to go and visit those places. So, the C of that one is the hemoprophylaxis. And we have to look at the risk versus benefit. Okay. So, the first thing that we're going to look at is resistance patterns. Because malaria has become resistant to many of the, the drugs that we use to prevent it. Okay. The intensity of the transmission. <coughs> Okay, so that's, is it in the dry season, is it in the rainy season, how many mosquitoes are there, the duration of the stay, so if you're going for a shorter period, it's probably not as necessary as if you're going for a longer period, the age, like I say, children and um, the elderly are more at risk. And then medical history, because if they're immunocompromised, it's also a problem. So this is a very old map of that shows you where the chloroquine-resistant malaria is. So you can see that most of Africa's malaria is chloroquine-resistant. So we're not going to use chloroquine in Africa. Okay. There are some parts of um, the Middle East and mid in the middle of America that still have chloroquine sensitive malaria and then our multi-drug resistant malaria is here in the East Thailand those places so the chemoprophylactic agents that we get is mefloquine, doxycycline Atovaquinone and proguinol and chloroquine. So usually when we're going to Africa, we'll use mefloquine or atovaquin proguinol. So mefloquine is also the drug of choice for pregnant women. First prize is that pregnant women do not go to malaria areas. But second prize is they must be on mefloquine. So mefloquine, the problem with mefloquine is its neuropsychiatric side effects. <laughs> yes. So if there's any history of depression or psychosis or schizophrenia in the it becomes a little bit problematic. Also, you shouldn't operate heavy machinery or dive when you are taking mefloquine. 
and it's not recommended for children under five years. So there's quite a number of drug interactions, your cardioactive drugs, and then obviously your neuropsychiatric drugs. Um, and your side effects is dizziness, vertigo, headache, neuropsychiatric and visual disturbances. Okay. Tablet should be swallowed whole after meals with plenty of fluid. It may be crushed and suspended in water if needed, but it is very Okay. And then for mefloquine, you have to start one to two weeks before the time <coughs> and carry on for four weeks after you get back. So that's the thing about most of these malaria prophylaxis. You have to start X time before you go and you have to go on for X time after you come back. Then doxycycline. Doxycycline is usually used in your multi-drug resistant areas. Okay. So when you go to Thailand for holidays, um, Obviously, patient must not be pregnant or under 8 or 12 years of age. Um, and you know all the doxycycline yeah. stuff already, <coughs> so I won't go through it. And then the law, well not the law, it's over Kunan pro combination. Okay, that is also a, a nice one. If, if you can't um, tolerate mefloquine. Uh, common side effects, gastrointolerant mouth, mouth ulcers, stomatitis, um, contraindicated in severe renal and hepatic impairment, pregnancy, and for children under 11 kilograms. So you can see most of these drugs children can't take. back from holiday from a malaria area needs to be on the lookout for flu-like symptoms. If they are experiencing any flu-like symptoms, they need to report it and say that they want malaria test. Because if you don't treat malaria, you can die from it. Okay, so be very vigilant when you are counseling people about when they are going and coming back from malaria. I mean, malaria can even happen three months after you come back. So you might not think about it. And you hear about people dying from malaria because people didn't think to say, I think it's malaria. Okay. So the mechanism of action of antiplasmodials this is actually quite intricate and there is a lovely video on YouTube. If you are interested in malaria, if you come from a place where malaria is endemic, okay, then it might be interesting for you to watch this because it's a lovely video that explains the pathophysiology of malaria and then exactly where in the life cycle um, these drugs work. So I'm going to give you a quick, you know, rundown. But if you really are interested in malaria and if you're going to work in a malaria area one day, you know, it will just be, it's, it's a lovely video, the, the, the thing that I put there, the HTTPS. What do you call that? Link. Uh, the link, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so you will. S so there are many different targets. So basically, you are targeting the parasite in one of its places. So 
the, the mosquito will bite you and the parasite will go into the liver first. Okay? It will sit inside, it will go inside the liver cells and make little babies. Okay? Until the liver cells burst. So you're gonna get some liver problems if you have malaria. And then when they burst out of the liver, they go into the blood and they infect red blood cells. Okay. And then they eat the hemoglobin inside of the red blood cells for food. And then the red blood cells also burst. So malaria can cause anemia because the red blood cells are dying off because the, the parasite uses the red blood cell as, as food and to make new babies in there. Okay. So you will find that quinolone and mefloquin um, works in the digestive vacuole. So basically <coughs> the plasmodium or the parasite is going to take the hemoglobin from the red blood cell and digest it. So one of the steps of digestion is where the, the heme makes a toxic compound. And so normally the inside the food vacuole of the parasite there will be a detoxification step. Okay. Now Chloroquine and mefloquine stops that detoxification step. So the toxic metabolite of the hemoglobin metabolism um, accumulates inside of the parasite and it dies. Okay, does that make sense? So that's how mefloquine and chloroquine work. They inhibit the detoxification of heme, which is a a product of hemoglobin. Then um, a tovaquone uh, interfere with electron transport energy production in the mitochondria of the, the parasite. So if you are inhibiting the mitochondrial energy production, the, you are starving it of energy. So it can't function. Um, Proguanol is a folic acid synthesis inhibitor. So, can you remember which antibacterial also inhibits folic acid synthesis? Sulfonamides and trimethoprim, excellent. Okay, so in there, there are, for example, proguanol and sulfadoxin. They can inhibit folic acid synthesis in the parasite. So obviously it's going to inhibit the growth of the parasites by doing that. Um, then the doxycycline is a protein synthesis inhibitor. So it's going to block protein synthesis that is happening inside the protozoa. Okay, and then artemisinin which is usually used in the treatment of malaria, we'll see now, um, causes um, the inhibition of calcium independent <coughs> ATPase. It makes free radicals, and free radicals is usually toxic to many um, parts of the, of the <coughs> parasite. Okay. So that is a quick summary of the mechanism. Don't worry too much about <coughs> learning the mechanisms of anti-malarial drugs, okay? Because it is complicated and it's a very small part really of your work. So if you are really interested, you can go in there. But you have an idea of how it works now. Okay. Then treatment. Remember, we prevent malaria when we don't have it yet and that's the doxycycline, <coughs> mefloquine, chloroquine and tovaquinone and um, carbonyl. 
with treatment, we use different drugs. So if you have an uncomplicated falciparum, falciparum malaria in South Africa, they are going to treat you with artemisinin and lumefantrine. Okay, so it is a combination tablet. I think it's usually for, for six days, the treatment. Okay? So that is when you have malaria, when we treat you. So you get the uncomplicated malaria and then the severe malaria can be either treated with opticinate or quinine. Okay, and then you will have the IV um, treatment. So if we look at our artemisinin and lumefantrine combination, um, it's interesting. This is, have any of you treated the malaria with artemisinin before? Because this is a, a very interesting counseling that you have to do with a patient because the bioavailability of the drug is increased with a fatty meal. So in the, the guidelines, in your EML, you're going to see that they usually have a very specific type of meal. Now I can't remember and it's not on there. But they, they usually will say 1.2 grams if I remember correctly. Can somebody just check it please? Malaria treatment in the EML, so that we can. It's it's quite interesting. Um, contraindications: hypersensitivity, QT prolongation, decreased potassium and magnesium. And it has a drug interaction with hepatic enzyme inducers and inhibitors, and obviously antiarrhythmics because it prolongs QT. <coughs> um, oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's on the next slide. Yes, you see, I remember 1.2. So usually you administer it with food or drink, and you want to take it with milk containing at least 1.2 grams of fat. Okay. Um, you will usually see an uh, improvement within 48 hours and the treatment is usually uh, 6 doses over 3 to 5 days. Or for 5 days. Okay. <coughs> and this is for uncomplicated malaria. If you have complicated malaria, you either use your artesanate or quinine. Okay? And quinine is quite toxic as well. It, um, it's famous for genoism, which is a side effect that affects your ears. You have tinnitus. What is tinnitus again? The ringing in the ears. It can impair your hearing, headache, nausea, blood vision, and giddiness. So that is the, the package of side effects that you get from quinine. Okay. Um, but that's for your severe um, pneumonia. So the more severe it is, the more severe the side effects will be here. So you will have your CNS toxicity, cardiovascular toxicity, and so on. Do you remember a few years ago there was a there was a shortage of artemisinin, lumefantrine drugs in South Africa? And they had to put people on IV twenty because that was the only drug that they had. It was the malaria season in South Africa stretched for a longer period because they had weird rains. And so usually the pharmacy will get in medicines in the rainy season, but because this season was so long, they didn't have the right 
you know, enough of those medicine in stock because they never use it during that time. So there was a big shortage of it and they had to treat patients in patients with quinine and these hectic drugs instead of just sending them home <coughs> for six days. So that is, um, was quite an interesting thing that happened. So the rest of this, this lecture is on ecter, ectoparasites, which is scabies and lice, and um, worms. So I'm not going to really go through it, because it's quite self-explanatory, okay? You know head lice and body lice. Okay. Um, interesting just it's it's interesting if you know the life cycle and how long it takes you will also know when um, the when to watch for a if the, the thing didn't work so the eggs usually hatch in six to nine days so when you wash your hair with that permethrin shampoo um, and you didn't get all the nits out, you might in six to nine days have to repeat it because that's when the new lice come out. Okay. Um, scabies, you know. And then antalmintics. So we get our normal roundworms or our nematodes and we get our cestodes, which is our tapeworm. So the big difference is our nematodes, like normal roundworms and whipworm and hookworm, we treat them mostly with bubendazole or albendazole and our cestoids or our tapeworm, we, we treat with, with neclosamide or brazit one. So those are the main, the main ones. I think if you go through the quizzes or the practice quiz on Ikamba, you will learn everything that is in the slides anyway. So I'm not formally going to go through this because it's Something that we all should know, and it's small drugs. Is there any questions about this? Are you happy? Or tired? Yeah.